They told probably too much, said too much in this video, I'm telling you. So I told you we probably will go back to the future of finance bank for international settlements video. There was much more. There is much more we could dig into, really. But I just want to show you just this little bit. I'm going to close all. I'm going to close this chapter out. I want to show you this little bit. Listen to this. And you tell me this is not strange. Something is going on. Um, and now I'm beginning to think it's not just the desperation that's accelerating the the, the timelines and their their uh, their expedited push to to deploy you know bank coin technologies to congeal with the new financial system is not just that there seems to be something going on behind the scenes that we're not privy to um, and I'm going to tell you what when Augustine Karstens of the Bank for International Settlements is talking like this which is uncharacteristic in my humble opinion we've listened to countless speeches of this man it seems like just you tell me listen to this when, when I play it and you tell me it sounds like someone maybe above them there's always someone above these central bankers by the way there are big money people from old money where their names are not said They're in the, and everyone knows you don't say their names I'm just I'm telling you um, it seems like maybe someone's pulling strings. Why would listen to this? Let me play this. OK, I'm telling you, it's getting deep. All right. It's just a matter how deep you want to go. Let's push play here at, at 20 minutes. Go to 20 minutes, 20 minutes and 28 seconds into that video. We're going to start there. I just have two things I want to show you. Then we're going to move on to some other big crypto news. Listen. Same time. And just this is uh, I think this is just to make to say. To set the, the, the record straight. We all Wait, first. At that moment, look how he stuttered. Uh, the, 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 for, for, if in that, he said, and to set the record straight. It's like when you're nervous, about, it's a nervous tick. What's making him nervous? What's making a man with this immense power nervous? The only thing that can make someone, I mean, listen, maybe you have a different perspective. That's why I'm asking you. Listen to this and you tell me what you think. Um, but the only thing, if I'm correct, that can make a man like this nervous is someone with more power than him. It's like, who is that? Why? What's going on? And if that is the case and there is someone behind the scenes or maybe a group of people pull, pulling some strings and pushing and saying, hey, get this done right now. We don't care what you're doing. Get it done right now. Um, that means the future is is, is close to guaranteed of, of what this DLT new fine DLT led new financial system is going to be. But let me play that one more time. I want you to hear that. Listen to the stutter. And then he says, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, to set the record straight, who are they setting the record straight with? It's not with us. We read all their documents. We pretty much, we're on the same page. We are not on the same page as the BIS, but we understand their direction. Who's he setting the record straight for? You tell me, listen to this. This is strange. I'm telling you. Wait, wait. Here we go. Here we go. To, make, to, set, to set the, the, the record straight, we always try to be a good citizen, global citizen. And they're trying to convince people that oh, we're, 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 we always try to be good. Who said you're not? Who are you trying to convince? Wait. It's like we. It's like when a no disrespect. It's like when a child gets disciplined by a parent, and then they have to justify themselves. I was always a good boy. Who are you saying this for? That's not it. That's not it. Just wait. Let's let's listen to some more. It gets deeper. And the, the BIS do not operate with any countries, nor their, their products can be used by any countries that is subject to sanctions. And this oh, I see. Uh-oh, BIS. What have you done? Now, I was just talking about how the BIS over the years has seemed to try to stay neutral, right? They tried to stay out of all the geopolitical nonsense from what I've seen. Unlike the IMF and ECB, obviously they have clear sides that they're taking, right? They're clearly siding with the U.S. and everything. And now look at the BIS. Now I see maybe that's who's pulling the strings. He says, uh, you know, we're, we're, our products are not going to be used by any countries that are subject to sanctions. And we know what that means. So that, what does that tell us now? Number one, BIS is now leaning a particular way heavily. That's number one, which some, some people may say, well, that was going, always going to be obvious. No, it wasn't because they're working heavily with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, working heavily in Hong Kong, working heavily with a lot of countries that are associated with who the BRICS nations. And that's where this gets major, folks. The BIS just pretty much told you. That fragmentation is here to stay. 
that the, the need for interoperability will not be solved by them. That's as close to a guarantee that that big money is coming to some of these private, true private sector, DLT led, fintech led companies that have interoperability, that have true global reach. What they just announced to the world that people are not understanding when he says to read the transcript here, go to this. This is at 20 minutes and 51 seconds in that video and read it for yourself. Make your own interpretation. Just, just mine. I only speak for me. But what he just told people pr pretty much is that the central banks of the world no longer can lead. They can't. They are localized. They are regionalized. They are, are, are uh, uh, siloed permanently. The BRICS nations, whether people like it or not, are a huge swath of the world. And they're economically going to stick together. Right? So if they can't work with someone with sanctions, and we know who's heavily, we know who's heavily sanctioned. And those who are heavily sanctioned are tied to China, tied to India, tied to South Africa, tied to Brazil, and a whole host of other countries banding together economically to have this economic alliance. Then the BIS can't operate uh, the way that it used to in the bulk of the world now. That's what he just admitted. That's what he just said. This changes everything. That's a game changer. That's trillions of dollars for the taking. That's as close. Listen, there's no guarantees for the future, of course. I know, I know, I know. You don't got to tell me. I know it better than anyone. But that's as close to a guarantee as you're going to get. Permanent fragmentation. They were the last hope of the legacy system to try to reach for global, global reach and interoperability. And now it makes perfect sense. Look at that. Okay, so they can't work with the bulk of BRICS nations, possibly. I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb there because BRICS nation is going to stick together, but they can't work with some of them that with any country that has sanctions. However, they have certain projects going on that they have thought of shutting down. And now it makes sense why they thought about shutting those projects down because they wouldn't function properly without being able to be you utilized in that major uh, that major aspect of the world. If if indeed, and I think they're they're waiting to see how. A lot of things are going to be received, so how some of these energies now are going to be received. But if those countries are not going to be cooperating or, or BIS is going to be heavily uh, hindered because of their associations and such, you know, we know how the powers of the world do. Those projects cannot be, which means who's going to lead? Who's left? You have companies like Ripple, True Global Reach. They have all types of that's why yesterday's video was so powerful with the RCHAX thing and then all those countries coming together. You know, uh, Japan, Korea, et cetera. What the world lacks is, is global reach, interoperability. They still have the desire for somewhat of a one world system. That's not going to happen, but they'll settle. These people, they know how to settle. They want to have this idea that they'll win at all costs, which means even though fragmented, once again, they don't care how that value and power comes in. They don't care who it comes by way of. And now it makes perfect sense, in my humble opinion, why the West is saying private sector. BIS is saying private sector. ECB, even though they try to be so, the ECB tries to be like the tough parent. But they've been saying private sector. They can't, there's no other way. This is what Micah is all about. Yeah, sure, they're trying to be tough. Private sector is going to lead the way. They're dominating. This is why you see in the main region, the private private sector is dominating. I'm talking about DLT fintech led private sector, the true private sector, not intertwined with governments, not totally controlled. The one that they fear the most. Wait, you, you might say to yourself, um, well, make they, you know, they don't fear them. Wait a minute. There's more to this. Did you stick? Did you make it this far in the video? This one got deep. Listen, let's go here. Um, let's go to. Uh, about 21 minutes and 43 seconds. And this is really what I wanted, I wanted to, you to put your ear to because I know there's so many brilliant people out there. I'm not the only, uh, I'm not the only researcher here. I'm not. Um, listen to this and tell me this isn't strange how this man put this verbiage. But wait, let's go there. 21 minutes. Hold on. <laughs> Let me get there as well. Wait, wait, bear with me. Hold on now. Somebody's like, I'm already there, Mick. I was there before you. I'm going to go to 21 minutes and 42 seconds to give us a little bit of breathing room here. And let's play that. And you tell me what he says isn't strange. Why do he say that? I'll give you my thoughts in a moment. Let's push play on 21 minutes, 42 seconds.
and uh, is basically putting regulation behind the curve, right? What's your view on that? I mean, how uh, should we basically see the world in terms of regulation versus what's happening in the market, okay? And basically putting the way it is today in which the banks versus the fintechs were basically losing the battle in terms Oh my, did you hear what he just said? Banks versus fintechs. Wait, 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 what did he say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you exactly, I'm gonna read it exactly from the transcript. Banks versus fintechs were basically losing the battle in terms that they basically can go ahead and disrupt the market. Boom, if that's not a, if that's not a bombshell, if that's not explosive, I, we've been saying it for years, I, I showed you. Long time ago, what Christine Lagarde said that DLT could render central banks uh, uh, irrelevant, useless, moot. Then someone else, a representative from the banks, we showed the article. People downloaded it. They screenshotted it. It's real. They said this year, another representative of oh, you know, the DLTs, could uh, how much power they could take away from the central banks, pretty much rendering them useless and uh, changing the very way, nature of what a central bank is. Or, or, or I mean... <sighs> And now you have him saying the same thing. This is an interview with the BIS. Th it doesn't get more serious than this. He just said, banks versus fintechs, where basically they're losing the bank. Banks are losing the battle. I'm paraphrasing. I'm adding because the verb is a little choppy here. All right. In terms that they basically can go ahead and disrupt the market. We've already seen a lot of disruption. What are, they, what are they talking about? What more disruption? And then keep in mind, a common theme throughout this interview is how far behind the legacy system is. They literally say that. We covered it early in the video. Did you watch this video? Future of Finance on the BIS channel is deep. So if we can go ahead and disrupt and the banks can't compete with us, that's what he's saying. They're basically losing the battle. Where who's winning? We're winning. Who are they running to to get all their technologies from? You know what that means? When you have that kind of power, that kind of influence, when everyone needs what you have and you have the, the, the supposed alleged top of the top people in those industries saying you're winning. That equates to a lot of value. A lot of value. Interbank payments, think those trillions, uh, B2B, cross-border trillions, RWA, trillions. Where else do you go but up? Sure, there's going to be some turbulence. Where else do you go but up? Where else does that price go at some point? Not financial advice. Where else did that price go but up? This is real information, real research. Now it's up to you to do your calculations and decide for yourself. But that's what they said, folks. But wait, let me play one more time, and then we're going to move on to some real, uh, uh, some, some not real, but uh, some other crypto news, okay? Wait, wait, I'm going to go back to that. I want to hear that one more time, and then we'll let it play through. There we go. In which the banks versus the fintechs were basically losing the battle in terms that uh, they basically can go ahead, disrupt the market, and get away without following the regulation. So <laughs> and now they have... Uh, pre uh, pretty much admitted the truth about regulations. So the disruption and look how he stuttered. What he's saying doesn't make sense. So they can go ahead and disrupt the markets, but somehow regulations have uh, will somehow affect the speed at which they dominate the markets, which means you're, you're admitting that regulations are nothing more than blockades to slow down the innovation. Now, we always have speculated that many of us have brilliant minds. We've said that, but but. It was never said by the central banks. Thank you for saying that, sir. Thank you for confirming that for us, sir. You see, and that's the thing about these individuals. You have to listen to some of these interviews. I know it can get boring. That's why I try to make it a little bit entertaining for us so we can get through this because it's important because these individuals are not used to talking uh, intellectually as long as you and I are. We're veterans here. We know how to speak. We know what to say, when to say it. And how to phrase certain things. And yeah, so we don't have to get things right all the time. But we, you and I, are very professional. These individuals, while they're in a professional environment, they don't have a lot of um, experience speaking before large audiences, speaking before the camera for long periods of time. That's not what they do. They do this every once in a while. So they're rusty. So they can slip up. They, they have uh, so many like secrets. That's another thing. 
To be a secretive person, sooner or later, you talk enough, things are going to come out. But people like you and me, we're, we're pretty open. There's no secrets with us. So we can just talk and we're, go we're, we're good to go. These people have so many secrets here that it slips out once in a while. It's preceded sometimes by a stutter. Their mind is trying to remember what to say, what not to say. You got to pay attention to that. Why do you say it like that? Go listen to that, please. I'm going to leave that here. Oh, man, I could cook a little bit more with that video. That video gets so deep. It's actually a little bit scary, actually, to see all of these like hidden agendas and powers moving. And that's what we're observing. Listen, there's always going to be that which is apparent and that which is not apparent. The the um, that which is observable and the unobservable, the known, the unknown. That's always going to be there. The left, the right. There's a balance to everything. You have to know this. That's a real thing. All right. So now let's go here. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to get a little bit of this regular crypto news in here. Appreciate every single one of you. And I, I definitely appreciate the members only section, all the comments I've been getting in the members only section. Thank you so much for saying those things, asking questions, engaging. I appreciate that. So now this article here is titled XRP Ledger. Wait, Dow confirmed. Big things continue to happen. This right here says uh, prominent uh, community member, Crypto Airy. Shout out to Crypto Airy. Still doing a good job after all this time. Amplified the news by sharing a video snippet of David Bacheri, CEO of XRPL Commons. We have a lot of brilliant people in this uh, in this XRP community. From his recent interview with Web3 Deep Dive, in her commentary on XRE outlined, the timeline of the governance changes, noting, quote, XRP Ledger governance is changing. We first learned about exploration with XRPL Labs, XRPL Commons, and Ripple in Australia not-for-profit wave of innovation in XRPL Labs post September the 6th. So big things continue to happen. Every little positive thing is one more mechanism in the engine of the Lamborghini. And then sooner or later, that engine is going to be complete. XRP is the Lamborghini and it will take off. It will be a beautiful thing in my humble opinion, right? Just my humble opinion. All right, we're going to move on here now to this here. And I like to keep up with these types of things here. Look at this. Singapore creating networks to commercialize digital asset tokenization platform after successful trials. Who has a huge hand in what the Monetary Authority of Singapore does? And I'm talking about besides the BIS. Of course, um, Ripple has a great relationship with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. We know this. MAS partners with global financial giants to enhance liquidity and infrastructure and tokenized assets. Here's the problem. Once again, you're dealing with a siloed, a siloed system, a fragmented system that will not have global reach. And then if you have a great relationship with someone like Ripple with true global reach, then you need you need to you need to have that aspect. I mean, why wouldn't you utilize their services at some point? I would think that the very nature of you establishing such a, a relationship would be so you could utilize that that particular aspect later on. This just makes sense. You don't establish that type of relationship for nothing. Um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, this could be huge. Things are getting bigger and bigger, folks. Just, this is what I'm observing. Um, has announced several initiatives designed to enhance tokenization within the financial sector. According to a November 4th statement, according to the regulator, the move aims to strengthen tokenized assets, liquidity and support market infrastructure growth to help drive the adoption of tokenized assets. I want to say something else also. Um, so one thing I wanted to say about things like this, I think it's going to be a little bit bigger than what people are anticipating. Here's why. Now, if you remember, because of a lot of the financial struggles that the United States is having, and that's just statistically uh, uh, factual, um, there was a lot of selling going on that China did. Not just China, but I'm going to highlight China because they're one of the major ones that owned a whole lot of commercial real estate. And I'm just going to focus on that because I could focus on the, the farmland and et cetera, things like that. They bought a lot, China was buying a lot of farmland near rivers, et cetera. But I won't focus on that. Commercial real estate. They dumped a lot of commercial real estate uh, when things were going bad. Now, here's the thing. Once tokenization takes off and if anybody can change this economy around coming up in the next four years or whatever is going to be the next decade or so with token, the combination of a good economy, if we can get things back right again, good economy. And on top of that, and when I say economy, I mean across the board. There's a lot of people say, well, we're having a good economy now, Mick. I'm not just talking about big business, right? Just because big business is bringing in dollars doesn't mean the economy is good. You have to be doing well at the top and the bottom. Um, big money people and big money uh, and big money entities think like that. That's why all that dumping happened, just in case they had to protect themselves, or else they wouldn't have dumped all that commercial real estate. You see what you get? What I'm saying? So that's the that's the view I'm coming from. Now, if you combine a good economy with mass 
real world asset tokenization, I think that a lot of that business is going to be brought back. There's going to be a lot of cross purchasing over around the globe. China will come back. A lot of others will come back. They will be purchasing. The West is going to continue to invest and purchase things that they couldn't access and purchase before in the East. There is going to be a lot of money made. That RWA is going to be powerful. Um, and I don't think a lot of people are thinking about that. There's a wave of money that was pulled out, not money, a wave of value that was pulled out that can flood back in. And that's a part of. From all the money that is in money market funds and cash piles sitting on the side. Money market funds and cash sweep accounts. That's apart from that. But no, almost nobody's talking about it. That, there's a, that flood will come back. And not only that, but there'll be a little bit on top, theoretically speaking. Because as I said before, things that couldn't be, uh, you know, that weren't liquid before and couldn't be accessible before, easily moved before. Now they will be able to be that. The future is unbelievable if... Um, if the right if, if the right circumstances are there right but the mechanisms are lining up so now wait i have some solana yeah here's a problem we're getting deep in the video i have some solana i got chain link and i have gold left let's do this a little bit of solana news why not solana saw its highest solana is always doing well highest monthly active addresses surpassing 120 million in october keep doing good solana i'm expecting big things out of you Solana had over 123 million active addresses on the network last month, reaching its highest level. Solana had its highest ever. Why did they said it three times in the title, then right below it, and then say it again. According to the Blocks Data Dashboard, the number of unique addresses that signed transactions across Solana increased by over 42% from September's figure. The network had less than 12.7 million active addresses in January this year. Keep doing well, Solana. I got to cut that one a little bit short to get to this chain link news. All right. I'm, try I'm trying to keep the video at a certain length. All right. I can see that that through the analytics that people like it a certain length. Chain link sees a chain link sees a flurry of adoption with integrations across 14 blockchains tell me Chainlink isn't working hard they're doing a great job Chainlink integrates with 34 services across 14 blockchains including arbitrum base solana and hedera the protocol reaffirmed its collaboration with swift to incorporate blockchain into global financial transactions with plans for banks to trial digital asset transactions next year advent look at that with plans for banks to trial digital asset transactions next year. So we have some big things to look forward to when it comes to Chainlink. I'm ready. Do what you need to do, Chainlink. I want that price to explode. I'm not joking at all. I see big things in your future. You, Chainlink, I'm looking at long term. Yeah, you moved out of that, that phase I had where I'm, I'm watching. I'm like, eh, this might be able to, I might be able to move this next bull run. Maybe not. You're becoming a true bank coin. I'm going to have to I'll put you in an XRP, uh, XLM, Algorand category in quant and keep you long term. So then we're going to end off with this little bit of gold news right here. This article is titled about that U.S. $3,000 gold forecast from Goldman Sachs. $3,000 gold. Oh, that's beautiful to my ears. I love gold. A note from Goldman Sachs. This from late last week, analysts that at the firm are looking for a rise to $3,000 by the end of 2025. I, yeah, I think that's reasonable. I do. I think it's possible. I think it's reasonable. A lot of the catalysts are right there. Quote, an asset that doesn't offer any yield. Why do they always say that? We, we, we know that about gold. We know that. It says it typically becomes less attractive to investors when interest rates are higher. Yes, but when you have the right catalyst. That won't matter. It cancels them out. Certain things can cancel other things out. And it usually it's usually more desirable when rates fall on buying gold by central banks. Large scale central bank um, purchases of gold have rejigged the relationship between interest rates and price levels since 2022. GS estimates one estimates 100 tons of physical demand increases gold prices by at least 2.4%. Uh, it says freezing of certain countries, central bank assets in 2022 after certain activities. I'm, I'm redacting some things have prompted emerging market central banks purchases of gold. Well, it's just, it's just the, the, the idea of being sanctioned. 
Like they, none of those countries want that. And there's so many countries in the BRICS nations are just like, you know what? We don't want to even take that chance if it ever comes to that. Um, and also not just sanctions, but there's just overall manacles that are placed upon these countries when they deal with um, certain westernized central bank entities. They don't want that either. And gold protects you from that. Gold and DLT systems. That's what you see them going heavy with, right? It's a defense mechanism. Um, GS point out that central banks and developed markets have tended to have relatively high holdings of gold. And with, quote, China, for example, reports to have 5% of its reserves in the metal. Seen that way, some central banks and emerging markets are catching up to their counterparts in developed countries, unquote. Uh, then it says here, oh, well, okay, so listen, gold is very bullish. This is not the first time we've heard uh, a $3,000 price. It's, there's been a lot of these big companies saying that um, the last few weeks. So, and um, I'll tell you what, I would love to see gold go that high. The catalysts are there. I'm not sure how high it can go, um, but man, have you seen what's going on with some of these banks lately? You've been keeping up with the bank information. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Um, if those dominoes start falling, banks start going down. Geopolitical tensions don't cool off. Gold could skyrocket. It could. It really could. So, you know, we'll keep our eye on that and we'll see how it works out. So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with it. So until next time, everybody, let's get to the money.